Greetings, Watershed and Star of the North Schools. I'm Dr. Leroy Chow, and I'm here in Fairbanks, Alaska, and unfortunately, the uh, school has been canceled today, so our visit to your campus uh, can't be done in person. So I'm recording this video uh, as a small consolation. Hopefully, you'll get a uh, you'll get a little a little feel of what I was going to present to you at school today. Uh, it really is great to be up here in Alaska, and I hope that we'll have time maybe to drop by later in the week to at least say hello. So I'm going to start a slideshow that I'm going to talk to you about. Let's see. Okay. Well, as I just told you, my name is Leroy Chow. I'm an astronaut, and during my 15-year NASA career, I had the good fortune to fly four times into space. My first three missions were aboard space shuttles, and on my fourth mission, I trained with the Russians, flew on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station, where I served as the commander and NASA science officer on a six-and-a-half-month mission during Expedition 10. I can't remember a time when I wasn't interested in airplanes and rockets. I grew up in the 60s during the Cold War, during the very beginning of the space race. I followed those early space missions with a lot of interest. And the early astronauts, guys like Alan Shepard, uh, they were my heroes. But it really was the Apollo Moon program that captured my imagination and made me start thinking about wanting to become an astronaut myself. I can remember like it was yesterday as an eight-year-old kid watching the lunar module of Apollo 11 approach the surface of the moon and then actually touched down. And uh, even as a kid, I knew that the world had changed and I wanted to be like those guys who were up on the surface of the moon. Hours later, watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin take the very first steps of any human beings on another planetary body pretty much sealed the deal for me. I knew I was going to try to be an astronaut. Even at that age, I knew I needed a plan, and so I knew I needed to do well in school so I could go to college and, and get a degree in science or engineering. I also knew I needed to, do, to make the right decisions to keep healthy so that I could pass the medical exam to even be qualified to try to be an astronaut. So I worked really hard at all those things, and I did end up going to study engineering at the University of California, first at Berkeley, and then I got my graduate degrees, my PhD in Santa Barbara. I worked for a while in both commercial industry and also at the Government National Lab, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, when I put my application into NASA. I was fortunate enough to be asked to interview and then be selected. And in uh, July of 1990, I reported to the Johnson Space Center in Houston and uh, joined uh, 22 other people and other new astronaut candidates. And we started to uh, come together as a class to learn about what it took to be an astronaut and part of a crew. We came from all different walks of life. We had research engineers like me. We had military test pilots from the different services. We had a couple of medical doctors and a couple of physicists. And we started learning about NASA, learning about space shuttle systems. And then slowly we started getting assigned to missions. I was assigned to my first mission, which was uh, aboard Space Shuttle Columbia. And 25 years, uh, almost to the day of the Apollo 11 moon landing, we got our chance to go fly up into space. And it was really a special moment, as you can imagine, uh, having worked so hard and, and dreamed about getting up there and finally being able to, to, to get up and look back at the Earth. Uh, we were the second international microgravity laboratory. And what that means is that in the back of the payload bay, instead of having a satellite, we had uh, a laboratory module called Space Lab. And so this, these were the days before we had an international space station. So this was the main way we would do research in space. We spent two weeks flying and working around the clock in uh, two shifts, working 12 on and 12 off. And at the end of the mission, we had accomplished over 80 different scientific investigations. After we returned from that mission, I pretty quickly got turned around onto my second mission, which was aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour. We used the robotic arm of the space shuttle to retrieve a Japanese satellite that had been launched three months prior. But the biggest deal for me personally, it was the first chance I had to put on the big white spacesuit and go out and lead my first two spacewalks. What we were doing, we were testing tools and construction techniques that we would later use to build the International Space Station. On my third mission aboard Space Shuttle Discovery, we were a space station assembly flight. In fact, we were the second major assembly mission of the space station program. Uh, we brought two pieces with us to the International Space Station, used the robotic arm to position those pieces, and then using uh, uh, doing spacewalks, four spacewalks and two teams, we went outside and used tools to tightened up all the bolts and made all the electrical connectors. We also installed the main data link between the space station and, uh, and the ground. After the landing of uh, Space Shuttle Discovery, the uh, somehow 10 years had gone by. I had uh, uh, three Space Shuttle missions under my belt, and I was trying to figure out what, uh, what I wanted to do next. And uh, the chief of the astronaut office invited me to join the Expedition Corps. 
And this was something I hadn't really thought much about before because up to that point my career had been geared towards short duration shuttle missions and how we were going to build the space station. And now I was being asked to work and live aboard the station on what turned out to be a six and a half month flight. So I got to go, I, it was a big commitment. Uh, first of all, I had to decide that I wanted to, to actually uh, be on uh, be in space for six and a half months in a series of basically tin cans and uh, after I decided that I wanted to accept that challenge the bigger effort was uh, was the training. It was going to be at least three and a half years of training. I had to spend half of that time in Russia training with the Russians. I had to learn the Russian language pretty much to a uh, fluent level because I was going to fly aboard their spacecraft. Uh, getting to fly aboard the Soyuz was really a special treat uh, especially after having flown on board three space shuttles. We launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in uh, Kazakhstan, east of the Aral Sea. It took about nine minutes to get from the launch pad up into space. This was the crew, my crewmate, Salazin Sharipov. He was a, a Russian Air Force colonel, uh, but ethnically he was an Uzbek uh, who was born and raised in Kyrgyzia in Central Asia. So just a small piece of trivia, he and I comprised the first all-Asian crew in space. The main purpose of the International Space Station is uh, scientific investigation, so we did as many experiments as we could. But the main part of our mission and our series of missions was to keep the space shuttle or the space station in a state of good repair until we could get the space shuttle flying again. The space shuttle had been grounded after the Space Shuttle Columbia accident just a year and a half before our flight, and so the main tasks we had were to do maintenance work and do repair work to keep the space station healthy until we could get the shuttle flying and get the rest of the big pieces of the space station up there. We did a couple of uh, Russian spacewalks, and this was really a treat for me, having become an expert on you doing um, spacewalks using American spacesuits and American tools. Uh, getting a chance to put on the Russian spacesuit and go outside and do two spacewalks uh, was really a neat, neat deal. We, uh, what we did, we furthered space station construction by installing navigation antennas, and we also uh, did some science work installing a remote-controlled robotics experiment and retrieving experiment packages that had been left outside by previous crews. Spaceflight really is a magical experience. Uh, looking back at the Earth, the colors are much more bright and vivid than I had imagined they would be. And so the favorite thing we have, uh, we do aboard the station in our free time or when we're between tasks is to look out the window and shoot photographs. On this mission alone, I shot over 16,000 photos of the Earth. I'd just like to share a few with you. This is looking over the Himalaya Mountains into China, and from our perch of about 250 nautical miles up, the Himalayas look pretty small, the snow-capped mountains. Uh, but remember, buried among there somewhere is Mount Everest, which is the tallest mountain in the world. This is downtown Houston. This shows you what's possible with a little bit of practice on a clear day. In space, we're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, which is almost five miles every second. And so you actually can't just put the camera in the window and shoot because the image will appear blurry. So you have to track your target as you release the shutter. You're focusing, and by the way, you're weightless, so you better use your feet to hold on to something or you're just going to float away from the window. Here's some different places from around the world. This is Beijing, the capital of China. Uh, you see that rectangle in the middle? That's the Forbidden City where the old emperors used to live. This is New Orleans. Uh, this was taken in 2004 before the hurricane. This is New York City, Manhattan. And uh, you can clearly see Central Park. You can see the skyscrapers. You can see boats in the east and the Hudson Rivers. This is the southern tip of Florida, a very beautiful part of the world. The blues and greens are really spectacular. Here are glaciers in Patagonia in South America. Here's Egypt, the Great Pyramids. You can see the two big ones pretty clearly, and then the smaller one, the third one, just below them. Uh, I actually, once I found the landmarks, I could actually see these with the naked eye. There's two tiny little dots, the two big ones, when we flew over Cairo in good weather. Sometimes Mother Nature's just funny. I saw this in January of that year. I grabbed a camera and had the perfect thing to send to my wife for Valentine's Day. Well, six and a half months were about to come to an end. It was time to start to get ready to uh, go back down to Earth. So the Russian Mission Control Center asked us to put our suits on to make sure they still fit because in space, in the absence of gravity, your spine actually re relaxes and you end up getting taller. You get up one to one and a half inches taller. So they have to kind of accommodate for that when they build your suit. There you see I am in the right seat for entry, and you can see how cramped that little Soyuz spacecraft is. Really not a lot of room in there, not very comfortable, but it's a very reliable little spacecraft. 
We landed with a big thump on the steps of Kazakhstan, even under the parachute canopy. You're still coming down at about 25 feet per second, which is pretty darn quick. And so about one, about three feet off the ground, soft landing rockets will fire to cushion the blow. Uh, your seats have stroked up, and they'll react against the piston to take out some of the energy from the, from the impact. And uh, each seat liner is custom molded to each individual to distribute the load as much as possible along your backside. And if all these systems work, you hit pretty hard, but it doesn't hurt too much. As sometimes happens, we tipped over, making it a little even, even less comfortable. But uh, the rescue forces were right on top of us. They had us out in about 20 minutes, set us up in lawn chairs, handed us uh, satellite phones so we could call our, our loved ones and tell them that we were safe. After a quick ceremony in Kazakhstan, we uh, quickly got back on the airplane. We were flown back to Star City outside of Moscow, reunited with our families and our loved ones. And then I spent the rest of the year kind of finishing things up, writing the reports, give, doing the debriefs, uh, traveling around the world to thank all the people who had helped make our mission possible and a big success. And then I decided it was time to go do a few other things um, outside of NASA, including doing some consulting work both in aerospace and outside of aerospace. A few, uh, few years ago, I was asked to be part of a White House appointed committee to review NASA's human spaceflight program. And uh, our report formed the basis of the new space policy. And if you've been following the news on, the, on space in the last several years, you know that we've had a few small starts and a few, uh, few changes in direction. And I can kind of give you an update on where we are. We're still building the Orion spacecraft. We retired the space shuttle about three and a half years ago after we finished building the space station. And so this will be the next generation government vehicle. It's being designed to go beyond low Earth orbit and uh, uh, will form the, the crew capsule of any vehicle that goes to the moon, to an asteroid, or even one day to Mars. Below the, the Orion, we have to have a service module that's going to that's going to contain the engines and the tankage. Uh, and other systems that will allow the stack to maneuver once it gets up into low Earth orbit. We're building a new family of rockets called the Space Launch System, or the SLS. The version on the left will launch Orion and the service module into low Earth orbit. The version on the right is what we call the heavy lift version, and what it will do will take the rest of the pieces of a spacecraft that will be designed to go beyond low Earth orbit. It'll contain things like an Earth departure stage, which you can think of as a big gas tank with rocket engines that will um, that will enable the spacecraft to leave Earth orbit. It'll uh, have, have a lander if we plan to go somewhere like the moon or an intermediate position to, uh, to land. Or it may contain uh, parts of a habitat that we might be launching to Mars to stage in preparation for a crew to go visit uh, uh, the Martian surface. This is the uh, what we call the Flexible Path Exploration Program. You can see the goal is to get over to the right side of this diagram to the Martian surface. And the point of this is that there are a lot of interesting places you can go uh, to build the infrastructure and capability uh, before you end up sending people to Mars. There's talk right now of an asteroid uh, redirect mission or an asteroid mission, and the idea would be to uh, either bring a small asteroid into what we call cislunar space, that is the orbit between the Earth and the Moon, or to actually go visit an asteroid ourselves with the Orion vehicle. In my personal opinion, I think it makes a lot of sense to go back to the Moon. We haven't been back to the Moon since 1972, and it makes sense to create what we call a man-tended base there, uh, where we can go visit with astronaut crews to test our hardware. You want to make sure everything's going to be working correctly uh, before you send it off to Mars. The goal, of course, is to get over to the Red Planet and, uh, you know, things, things we dream about. When is this going to happen? Well, I don't know, but it's probably going to be one of you kids or your generation that gets to go to Mars. So think about it. You, one of you kids out there today might be the first person on Mars, and wouldn't that be cool? One of the most exciting yet the most controversial parts of the new space policy is that NASA was directed to start working with commercial companies to try to help them develop the capability of launching astronauts to and from the International Space Station. The idea is that uh, we know how to send astronauts to low Earth orbit. We've been doing that for over 50 years. And so the question is, can we stimulate business to take that over, uh, kind of like you would rent a car instead of buying your own car, and NASA could rent services from these commercial companies to send astronauts and, and cargo to and from the International Space Station. So currently two companies are, are receiving NASA assistance and funding. SpaceX has been in the news quite a bit lately. They've successfully delivered cargo to the space station several times using their Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 launcher. And they are currently working on a version of their Dragon spacecraft that will take astronauts to and from the space station. 
The other name uh, in this business is very familiar, the Boeing Company. Uh, they are building a commercial spacecraft called CST-100 that is being designed to take astronauts to and from the International Space Station. But in this case, in the case of Boeing, instead of using uh, a new rocket, they are going to rely on the, Del on the Atlas V rocket. Uh, the Atlas has been in the U.S. stable for quite a few decades in different variations. A very successful rocket, our most popular and successful rocket. And uh, right now, United Launch Alliance, who builds and operates the, the, uh, the uh, Atlas V, is looking at what it would take to human rate the vehicle to allow it to launch astronauts into space. The International Space Station, the current plan is to operate it through at least 2024. Uh, the ISS is important because before we talk about sending a crew to Mars or somewhere like that, we've got to figure out all the biomedical issues of how to keep astronauts healthy on a mission that takes us that's so far uh, into space and so long in space. Uh, you know, basically that's the biggest technical driver is how do we keep people healthy for, for missions like that. And the space station is the perfect place to test what we call countermeasures or techniques and, and and uh, that we would use to, to counteract the negative effects of being in space. Finally, this is a picture I want to leave you with. This is a picture, of course, of the moon. This I shot this from the space station using the long lens. Uh, the moon is what inspired me to want to be an astronaut all those years ago. And on the left side of this picture is Mother Earth, home planet to us all. And that blue in the middle is kind of what I want to call your attention to. That's the atmosphere of the Earth. The sunlight passing through the atmosphere causes it to fluoresce, all these beautiful different shades of blue. And that's what really surprised me the most well, the first time I went into space is that uh, I really couldn't, um, you know, this kind of thing doesn't get captured very easily by, by uh, photographs. And so I looked back at the Earth the first time, and it was just so bright and blue that it just uh, took my breath away. And so this photograph to me says dreams, and that's really what it's all about, especially for you young, younger folks out there. It's so important to think about what you'd like to do with your life and to make a plan and then really not be afraid to go after it. And it's okay if you change your mind. It's normal as you get older and you get more human experience to have develop new interests or go in different directions. The main thing is to, to always keep moving forward and to, uh, to not be afraid to dream and not be afraid to go after it. So with that, I'd like to, uh, again, uh, I tell you how much I'm, I'm enjoying being here in Fairbanks and how much I wish I could have come in person to see you guys today. Uh, unfortunately, you, you, know, you, you weren't able to go to school, and so, uh, as I said, we'll try to catch up with you guys later in the week and um, uh, come by at least to, to say hello. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and uh, wish you all the very best of luck. Thanks.